Welcome back. This is week four of inverse methods in heat transfer. We are going to discuss an important algorithm. This is not directly in uh, inverse methods that it's an important algorithm, but it seems to be a very important algorithm currently within machine learning. So this algorithm here, gradient descent is an optimization algorithm. It's a very simple optimization algorithm actually, far more simple than the normal normal equations method that I showed you, which I said was a direct method, but this is what is known as an iterative method. That is, you make some guesses for the parameters you're optimizing for, and you keep on improving them. As I had said, this is a standard process within any inverse problem within machine learning uh, and without machine learning also. So the idea here is to give you an introduction to a very simple algorithm, and we'll also go for a more complex algorithm later on in this week, what is known as a Gauss-Newton algorithm. Okay, so this is the first introduction. Even though you will not find gradient descent within uh, inverse methods books, mostly you will not find them. You will find other algorithms. So there are other optimization algorithms within uh, inverse methods or in general in optimization methods. So these are part of what is known as descent methods. So you can see the word gradient descent. So gradient descent is a specific class of a descent method. So there is something called uh, Cauchy's steepest descent method. Of course, there is gradient descent. And all these are gradient based methods. And there is something called conjugate gradient. This is not strictly speaking a descent method, but that's okay. So conjugate gradient. Then there are Newton methods, one of those which we will. Now, what is the idea? The idea is this, you have some function, okay? So you have fun some function J, which is a function of W. So this is the cost or the objective and this is the parameter or set of parameters because w itself could be made up of w0 w1 w2 lot of things till wn as he saw earlier so there are a bunch of parameters and what you want to do is to find out find the w that minimizes j now, you might ask, optimization means I could maximize also. Of course, all the problems we are doing are trying to minimize the gap between reality and our model. So typically, we use uh, minimization. But as it turns out, if instead of minimizing J, you have a maximum problem, you just maximize ma minus of or minimize minus of J. And that also is a uh, basically any maximization problem by taking a negative can be turned into a minimization problem. But that's an optimization course. Let's come back to our purposes where we are typically always minimizing. And that's where we use all these algorithms. There are multiple other algorithms which are not based on the gradient. In the last video, I showed you what a gradient means. At least I reviewed what a gradient means. And as we discussed, what a gradient means is suppose I have this parameter space and I'm looking at x, y, or let's say w1, w2. Let me correct this a little bit. So suppose I'm looking at W1 and W2, two parameters, and let's say this is J. Okay. So at this value, okay, let's call this um, some something, let's say W1, 1 and W2, 1. At this point P, um, let us say we are moving up and trying to find out the value here. So the Z axis here gives you J at 1. Similarly, at another point Q, this gives you, let's say, J at Q or J at the second point. Okay, at, This is a different value of W1 and a different value of W2. Now, let us say we are somewhere here at this point. Okay, you can imagine that you are on this hill, which is represented by this complex surface. Okay, You are on this hill and the lights are off and the only thing you know is your current position. But somehow you want to make your way up to the bottom of the hill, which is where home is. 
but all you can look at is maybe you keep your foot out and sort of measure you know what is the slope around me and the general idea of a de de uh, descent algorithm is very simple see we are looking at this whole surface but the computer doesn't know it only knows the value of the loss function at the particular point okay given this w1 which is say minus 40 and this w2 which is minus 60 what is j and it will figure out what the j is and it will say okay it's minus 2 but it doesn't know whether this is good enough or not unless it looks here what is the final goal the final goal for all these is to reach at a place which is the bottom and what is this bottom characterized by the minimum is characterized by the fact that wherever you look around the minimum so if i am at the minimum here what you will notice is it is flat any direction you move you will always move up so if you are here at the bottom and you keep your feet out it will be relatively flat here and that is the intuition or the physical intuition behind saying del j del w1 is zero del j del w2 is zero okay. and of course minimum also has certain implications on the second derivative but those are more complex so we will leave that out for at least for any optimum you automatically know these two should be true and another way of writing it based on our discussion of gradient is to say gradient of j with respect to w is a zero is zero at the minimum so this one condition is what we will try to satisfy okay this is the basic idea. Now, we are going to use another intuition here, which we also discussed in the previous video. And let's go and do that and start looking at what else information the gradient has. Okay. Now, you might remember, okay, um, from again from your uh, college days, that if you are given any function f of x, I'm going to again use f of x to recollect what you did in college in the first couple of years. Um, that the direction of the maximum rate of change is given by the direction of, I have written given by this, but given by the direction of the gradient. Now, you might not remember this. If you don't, that's fine. I'm just going to prove it. Okay. So, this is a claim. Let's explain this claim first and then see what the proof is. A very quick proof. Once again, go back to the hill. So, this is sort of an inverted hill shape. You are traveling from somewhere and you are coming to the bottom now let's say once again you are at some point and you don't know you really don't know which direction you should move in you just have the value at that point okay um, more specifically we can look at this figure where this is at least a little bit more complex so you are at this point you want to know which direction you have to move in and you have really nothing other than the position here you have your feet and you're feeling around and each direction you put your feet you know that in some directions you are moving up, in some directions you are moving kind of down, and some directions you are moving really, really down. So the heuristic here is I will always move in the direction where locally I am going to move rapidly down. Now it's possible that you might be fooled that the surface might go up a little bit later, but we don't care about that. This is the heuristic with which we are working. Heuristic means a rough idea. So the idea is this the optimization algorithm is decided by the direction of the steepest change okay wherever i am feeling the maximum change i will move in that direction okay why is this important i will show it to you uh shortly but let us say that we are only trying to find out at any given point which direction should i move in so that i change the most rapidly so the claim here is move parallel to the direction of the gradient if you move along the gradient, you will either go up really fast and if you go exactly to the opposite of the gradient, you will go rapidly negative. Why is this? Because in the last video, I showed you this, that the rate of change in a given direction is given by del f del v. Okay. Remember, we had looked at partial derivatives. So if you have del partial derivative in direction 1, that is given by del f del x1. Partial derivative in direction 2, it is del f del x2. If you want how much change does the function face in any direction, in this direction, in this direction, in this direction, let's say this is the vector v, what we are saying is, is the maximum rate of change 
is given along the gradient and just any particular v is given by del f del v okay just like del f del x is along x del f del y is along y del f del v is along the direction v and how is that given this too we had seen the last time we take the gradient of f and dot it with the direction v cap once again same example if i take grad f and dot it with even vector this gives me del f del x1 because grad f is nothing but del f del x1 del f del x2 this is the way we represent it okay so from here you can get this so now look at this expression okay del f del v is grad f dot v now grad f is a vector as you know gradient is a vector this has a magnitude and a direction so let us say the magnitude of grad f is the magnitude of g we can call grad f as capital g so capital g vector so magnitude of g so if you take the dot product of two vectors magnitude of the first vector multiplied by magnitude of the second vector multiplied by cosine theta okay so as i have written here um on the left hand side uh, g is grad f theta is the angle between the gradient and v okay so suppose you decide at this point to go in this direction v and the gradient has this direction and this is theta then the amount of change that you will face in v is gradient multiplied by this magnitude multiplied by cosine theta that's what we have just shown now we want to maximize this or minimize this we want to maximize it we want to climb up really fast we want to minimize it we want to climb down really fast now this is simple if grad g's modulus and v are fixed v is a unit vector so this is just one this is the gradient of f we cannot change that but cos theta we can manipulate by changing the direction of v then all we need to do is ensure that cos theta is minus one so that it is minimum okay so maximum increase is along gradient and maximum decrease is opposite to the gradient so very simple idea i will come to the last line a little bit later but maximum decrease at a point is along minus gradient of f okay so for example if f is the function x1 square plus x2 square then gradient f is you can now see x1 e1 cap this is a vector plus x2 e2 cap okay so let us say at some x1 x2 so let's say at x1 x2 equal to 3 comma 4 this means grad f will be 3 e1 cap plus 4 e2 cap or you can call it the vector 3 comma 4 so maximum decrease now maximum decrease locally will be along minus 3 minus 4 okay so for example let me show you here or let's see this one okay so let's say you are at the point 3 comma 4 somewhere here okay this is not showing here on this graph but let's say this is this point 3 comma 4 and you want to find out in which direction do i move the fastest it will be here it will be minus 3 minus 4 something of that sort so for example let me take another point if i take the point 1 comma 0.5 then along minus 1 minus 0.5 which will be exactly uh, perpendicular to these contours here now one other thing it is very common to express these contours and it's important for you to understand the meaning of these contours now contours are lines of constant function a okay, constant f for example since this is the function x1 square plus x2 square everywhere on a circle whether it is of radius 1 radius 2 radius 3 or the function is going to have a constant value so let us see it here where it is a little bit more obvious 
if you come here this was also created using x1 square plus x2 square or actually something like yeah it was created using x1 square plus x2 square uh, now you can see that if i come at a particular point let's say here so if i come here and uh, move a little bit up if i move a little bit up i get a value now, if I look at a circle around this value, I'm going to be at the same height. For example, if I keep on moving along the circle, I will be stuck here itself all the while. This has some important consequences. The consequences are that if you have any surface at all, and you start looking at these lines or these paths where the function is a constant, you can sort of think of collapsing. Imagine that each of these circles that I was drawing here is sort of made up of a spring and you collapse that. Then you see this figure. This is basically what is known as the contour plot. The contour plot is just a two dimensional representation of this three dimensional plot, which is a surface plot. Now, how did we reduce this 3D to a 2D? Uh, we reduced it by giving different colors, as you can notice. So you can see that as it gets bluer, this is the typical convention is as it gets bluer, it means you are going to lower and lower heights. Okay, as it gets redder, okay, it's going to higher and higher heights. So yellow is slightly higher compared to blue, and you will see all this gradation from yellow, orange, green, right till blue. So this, this is typically what you will see. You will see red at a really height, uh, a big height. Um, so here, uh, what you can imagine is each of these blue lines is at the bottom and I would like you to physically imagine pulling up. Uh, you just imagine that you are looking at it top down and there are all these lines at each height, which is what you represent as a contour here. So typically when I say that we are going to lower and lower values along this, it's an easy way to visualize that actually you are coming down the hill. Okay, so it's. Uh, you will have to project a little bit of imagination using your color, but that's for human beings, that's at least something that is possible. Okay, so we, we try to represent from a 3D figure to a 2D figure. So the point here is you start at some point, arbitrary point, and somehow you should move in a direction which is always optimal. That's not possible, but with gradient descent, which is what I'm going to describe right now, we are going to use this simple idea that instead of Ensuring you always use along the best path, but at least local best path we will move. Okay. So now let us say we are trying to optimize. Once again, I'll go back to the original question. If we are trying to optimize the function f, and f is a function of x, and x are the parameters now, I will rewrite it in our usual form. So this is our cost function and x are the parameters, then we use a little bit of notation, which I will write down now. So let's say f star is the lowest possible value of f. That is, I keep on changing x so that somehow I come to the lowest point in this figure. Let's say f star would be the value right at the bottom. Okay, here, that would be f star. So we would say something like f star is minimum of f over all possible values of x. Okay, so that's the way it is written. Just like with limit, we have a notation. Okay. But where does it reach a minimum? So x star is the value at which f goes to f star. So for example, if I look at the function f equal to x1 square plus x2 square, we know that f star is 0 at x star being x1 equal to 0 and x2 equal to 0. Okay. So x star is 0, 0 and f star is also 0. So suppose I made this function as x1 square plus x2 square plus 3, you can easily see that f star is 3 and x star is still 0, 0. But can we call x star as minimum over x of f of x? We cannot do that. 
Okay. The reason we cannot do that is minimum actually is 3. The minimum possible value of f over x is actually 3. So we have a different notation. We call this argmin. What that means is the value of x for which f reaches f star. Okay. So for example, here f star is 3 in this example and x star is 0, 0 for which f reaches f reaches the value 3. So please remember this because sometimes I will use this notation min versus arg min. Min is the value and arg min is the argument or the parameter value okay, at which that minimum is reached. Okay. Having said that, let us now come back to the gradient descent algorithm. The idea is very simple. First step, you take a random guess for the parameter. So in this case, our parameter was x. Typically, we will call our parameter w within inverse methods. But for now, let us uh, human me and let's say this is x. Okay, So x is typically a vector. It is going to have multiple components, just like our w would have a whole bunch of components. Now, calculate at this step to calculate the gradient. gradient of that function with respect to x at this step, okay, at this value of x. Let's call this x, x0, okay, meaning at the very first guess. So now, the third step is this, improve. And you say, okay, my new x, that is, I'm going to move my point and I'm going to look somewhere within the neighborhood of hood of where I am in the hill. And I'll say this is x plus some delta x. Okay. Now this delta x is a vector. Okay. As you can see, it's going to have both a position as well as a magnitude. It, it's going to have a direction as well as a magnitude. And this delta x we know should be parallel to minus gradient of f. So we will say, okay, this is going to be minus gradient of f minus alpha multiplied by alpha. Another way of writing it is xi plus 1 equal to xi minus alpha times gradient of f at this point i. Okay. Very simple algorithm. What is alpha? Alpha is an arbitrary. I should call it parameter, but we call it hyperparameter because x are the parameters which we are solving for. It's called a hyperparameter. This is also called in machine learning. This is called the learning rate. And why it is called the learning rate is something we will come to later on when we come to uh, the machine learning chapter. For now, just assume it's a constant and we arbitrarily decide it. How much we keep alpha? decides how large the steps we take are. Again, going back to this picture here, um, let me go to this picture. Let's say you're trying to move from some point to the minimum. Now, let's say the gradient is here negative. I will show you this with an example. Let's say, okay, gradient is negative here. Let me take a large step. You might land up here. If you take a very small step, you will slowly go towards the minimum. If you take a large step, you might land up at really bad places. Okay, You can keep on jumping just because you're looking at local gradients. But the local gradients, you are taking a large step. Again, imagine you are walking down on a hill. Uh, you don't know where the hill is going to go back up. So you might take a small step locally where you know it's sloping down. But maybe a little bit later, it's going to slope back up again. Okay, So because of that, you have to adjust the alpha a little bit. Um, and we'll come to more details about this when we come to machine learning. As of now, I just want to show you an iterative, simple iterative algorithm. So that is it. Um, you keep on improving this. Keep iterating. 
okay either you use uh, some stop till some stop criterion okay so what is a stop criterion it's like when do you stop iterating so stop criterion could be okay uh, you can predetermine the number of iterations so for example you will say i will take a thousand steps and wherever i am i am at the minimum another more satisfactory one is we know where grad f remember that norm which i had told you about earlier you take grad f is very small so let's say grad f is the norm of grad f is small than 10 power minus 6 so you know that the gradient has become very small you know that at minimum gradient is going to be zero but we cannot always reach perfect zero so you can decide on stopping there Another possible way of stopping is to say that the difference between the current step and the previous step, that is the update that you are giving to your parameter size is very small, okay? Less than 10 power minus 6, less than 10 power minus 9, whatever. These are arbitrary uh, some uh, stopping criteria, okay? So these are called tolerances, etc. We will come to this later on when we come to the uh, gauss newton portion of um, this week's class okay so this is the gradient descent algorithm let me show you a very very quick demo with a simple example uh, where you will see the effect of alpha also so let's take a simple case now i'm going to switch notations here just for your convenience just so that you keep on thinking j and w instead of f and x so let's say j of w W itself is made up of two variables or two features, W1 and W2, is given as W1 square plus W2 square. We already know the theoretical minimum for this. As I said, we should somehow converge to 0, 0. Uh, we already know theoretically. And we could have done this using any of our theoretical techniques. We need um, W1 star is 0 and w2 star is 0 okay, so we know that now instead of that okay for convenience we could also make this plus 3 just like i did a little bit earlier okay now what we are going to do is give an initial guess following our algorithm initial guess is we don't know where the minimum is i am just going to say it is 3 comma 4 okay now i want the next step I am I am starting at the point 3 comma 4. I am somehow having to go to some other point. So the way to do it is to use the gradient update step. So first we find out del j del w1, which using this expression is 2w1. And of course, find out del j del w2, which is 2w2. Okay. So at the initial step or at the initial condition we know that grad of j with respect to w is going to be 2w1 which is 6 comma 2w2 which is going to be 8 okay so let us say alpha is 1 this gives us x or w in this case w is w minus so this is of course a computational notation a coding notation you can also say w at i plus 1 is w at i minus alpha times grad j at i so w1 is our original value was 3 comma 4 minus alpha is 1 and this is 6 comma 8 so this is w1 the new value is minus 3 comma minus 4 okay now you can go one step ahead and find out what w2 is and w2 would be w1 minus alpha times grad j at this one and what is grad j at one this is 2w1 comma 2w2 which is minus 6 comma minus 8. So W2 is W1, which is now minus 3 minus 4, 
minus alpha, which is 1. So 1 times minus 6 minus 8. So if you calculate this, this comes back to 3 comma 4. Okay. So what happened was very simple. You started with our initial guess. So serial number or iteration number. Then you have W and then you have WI and you have WI plus 1. So we started with 3, 4, ended up at minus 3, minus 4. Then you started with minus 3, minus 4 and you ended up 3, 4. And guess what? You will keep on cycling. So this is an example of what's known as a limit cycle. So this limit cycle happens because alpha is too large. We can show it in a figure here. Okay, So if you start here, let's say you start at some point. You start here and you take a large step and somehow magically you landed up exactly on the same contour but at the opposite side. Okay, So then you see the value, in fact, it will be the same. And then you look at the local step, okay, I'm supposed to move in this direction. But instead of taking a small step, you take a large step again and you go back here. So you are just oscillating between this and this. This is an example of taking a bad value of alpha. Now, what happens if you take a smaller value? I'll just show it to you quickly. So if we take a smaller value of alpha, say alpha equal to 0.5. Once again, let's say W0 is 3 comma 4. Now, grad J is once again 6 comma 8. But W1 is 3 comma 4 minus half of 6 comma 8, which is exactly 0 comma 0. Okay. Now this is good. Now what is grad J here? So grad J at the first value is now again 2 W1, 2 W2, so it is 0 comma 0. So W2 is W1 minus alpha, which is half multiplied by 0, 0. W1 is already 0, 0. So this is just 0, 0. So it stays here. Which is very good. So alpha equal to 0.5 turns out to be ideal. In one step, you reach the actual minimum. Remember, the minimum of the function is at 0, 0. So the reason we reach there is somehow we went here. We took exactly the right step. We were somewhere here. So we come somewhere here and we take a step which directly puts us to 0, 0. And of course, here it is flat. So any place we keep our feet around and we see it's flat. So we are just stuck here, which is perfect because it's the minimum. It can happen that you can get stuck at the maximum also according to the formula. But luckily, in this case, we know it is a minimum. So we are just stuck here. So this is an advantage of the gradient descent algorithm. Once you come to the minimum or once you come close to the minimum, you will always be there. Coming back to the algorithm, coming back to the algorithm, we saw that when alpha is high, when alpha is something like one, it can actually get stuck. When alpha is 0.5, it is just right. This typically never happens. But typically, we will take a small alpha, so something like alpha equal to 0 0.1. So if you take alpha equal to 0 0.1, uh, you will move a little bit more slowly. So you would do something like um, w1 is equal to 3, 4 minus 0 0.1 into 6, 8. So that will be something like 2.4, 3.2. So it will move slowly towards the minimum. In the next video, I will show you another example. Uh, since this video is a little bit too long already, I will show you another example with a slightly different function. Uh, and I will show you the code also for this function so that you can see how this can be done. Obviously, it's tedious to do by hand. In the exam or something, we might give you something like a couple of iterations. And we have given you some such examples within this week's exercise also. But apart from that, within the um, general practical realm, we program this. So I will show you a quick program for programming this kind of gradient descent and how you can progress.
uh, through various steps and reach convergence. So I will see you in the next video. Thank you.